Well, last week we heard about the shift that takes place in the Gospel of Luke, in Luke chapter 9. We're in this series uh, called Good News from Luke, looking at Jesus' life from birth through resurrection. And the Gospel of Luke does something unique in Luke chapter 9, where uh, Pastor Dan noted that Jesus resolutely sets his face to head toward Jerusalem. He is on a mission, and so we hear about it in Luke chapter 9. Now, it's an interesting thing to note at that point when you look at Luke as a book, right? In chapter 9, there's 24 chapters in Luke, and so it's interesting that this early on, he's heading toward Jerusalem for his crucifixion and eventually his resurrection and ascension to go up to heaven, as it says in chapter 9. But he doesn't reach Jerusalem until Luke chapter 19. So there's about 10 chapters, over a third of the book of Luke, that takes place on the way to Jerusalem, on the way to his crucifixion. We're reminded of that fact uh, at one other point in chapter 13, verse 22, It says there, then Jesus went through the towns and villages teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. So this is the the largest section in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. Now most of you are aware that there are four Gospels in the New Testament, four books that recount the story of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And each Gospel writer has chosen a unique way of framing and organizing the Jesus story. Luke uniquely structures his narrative with this long journey to Jerusalem that Jesus makes with his disciples as he announces his message and goes to accomplish his mission. So Luke's gospel, it pictures Jesus as this traveling preacher, which he talks about in Luke chapter 9, um, verse 57. He has this interesting exchange with someone who wants to follow him. It says, As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the son of man has no place to lay his head. And that is precisely the type of picture that we get of Jesus, this traveling preacher who goes around from place to place, goes on this long road trip. And he he teaches and trains his disciples on the way. So discipleship takes place on the way with Jesus. It takes place on the road. It takes place around the dinner table as he goes from place to place. And it's just as it says in Deuteronomy chapter 6 where Moses tells the Israelites to rehearse God's instructions when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. So did you ever wish that you could have been one of Jesus' original disciples, traveling with him? In, you know, observing him in the day-to-day. Well, in a sense, Luke allows us to do this not fully, not, full, uh, not fully immersive, but in a literary way. We get to go on this road trip with Jesus. We get to see his uh, interactions with his opponents. We get to see what he values, what he cares about. We get to hear the stories that he was telling the crowds as he traveled from town to town as he announced the good news of the kingdom of God that is coming among them, to witness the miracles and the healings and the exorcisms. We get to join Jesus' school of discipleship, despite not being physically present with Jesus in the, midst, in the Middle East in the first century. And so just to catalog some of the things that happen in, or that Jesus teaches on or touches on, in his school of discipleship, since we won't get to go into each, uh, in depth into each of these things. Um, We're really just doing kind of a drive-by version as we're going on this road trip. And we see that in Luke chapter 10, Jesus touches on loving your neighbor and what that looks like. And he tells the story of the Good Samaritan. Jesus teaches in his school of discipleship about praying and trusting God for what we need. He talks about confronting the religious leaders, and he does confront them, and they come and accuse him 
of using a, a, a demonic kind of power and he refutes it and tells them how he's bringing the kingdom of God. He uh, talks about standing strong when facing persecution. He talks about how to handle our possessions, to not give in to greed. He talks about diligently serving the master in preparation for the final day of judgment and to be repentant and to interpret the times. And that section applies to his own generation and his day of preparing themselves and interpreting the times of what's happening as well as in the future and uh, interpreting the end times as well. So I was reminded, uh, at, well, as I reflected on what to call this sermon, um, I was inspired by Pastor Dan's many references to songs, and so I titled it On the Road Again. Can't wait to get on the road again. The life I love is make mu- making music with my friends. Can't wait to get on the road again. And here we have Jesus' uh, back on the road, and we see... Uh, an, a fresh teaching as he travels from town to town. Now, when I take uh, a trip, whether I'm driving or flying to another town, state, or country, the most important part of the trip for me, what's the most important part of the trip for you? Uh, preparation. preparation, maybe? Yeah. People? Yeah. Be, who you're going to spend the time with? No, wrong answers. It's food. <laughs> it's what are you going to eat when you get there? No, I'm kidding. It, the people is more important. But the meal <laughs> is an important thing. It's, you know, that's, I want to know, what, what are we going to encounter? Where, where are we going to try to eat? On a journey, you have to eat. And in Jesus' school of discipleship, meals are very important, actually. <laughs> Believe it or not, the meals depicted in Luke's gospel prove to be crucial to the message of the whole book. We see early on in Luke's gospel, in Luke chapter 5, uh, Jesus, in, Jesus is just beginning his public ministry, and he calls a tax collector to follow him named Levi, also known as Matthew. And it says there in, in Luke 5, Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. He d- has another feast with a tax collector later on that we may hear about in a future week with Zacchaeus. But Jesus was criticized by the Pharisees and the the teachers of the law for this. Jesus said, the son of man came eating and drinking, and you say he's a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by all her children. What he's getting at there is that while he's associating with these, you know, disreputable people, these tax collectors and sinners, it may seem like he's compromising, but It'll, it'll prove out in the end whether these people are being transformed or whether Jesus is being compromised. And we see that their lives are transformed. We know that Jesus came to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. But what would that look like? And Jesus did that certainly through his healings, through um, Freedom through his, yeah, he brought freedom through his miracles, through his exorcisms, but he also went further and was willing to associate with the lowly and with the sinful. He was willing to share meals with them and invited them to join him. Later in the gospel, he, uh, he also hosts one of the biggest dinner parties ever when he feeds 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish, demonstrating God's incredible generosity and his power to provide for all who come to him. But Jesus doesn't only eat with the tax collectors and sinners in Luke's gospel. Uh, Luke kind of uniquely records three encounters where Jesus goes to eat at the house of a Pharisee. And these are kind of heated moments in the gospel. In the, on the first occasion, uh, he's eating there at, at the house of the Pharisee and a sinful woman showed up and washed Jesus' feet with her tears and anointed them with perfume. Jesus used this event to point out that the Pharisees' lack of hospitality and love, he didn't anoint Jesus when he came to eat. He didn't wash his feet. It shows that the, the Pharisee didn't have that love for Jesus. 
And the woman's great love demonstrated her faith and her gratitude for her sins being forgiven. The next encounter with um, at a Pharisee's house takes place um, where Jesus just basically rebukes those um, that are present. He chastises the Pharisees and teachers of the law for their hypocrisy and for their harshness for their treatment of these sinners and tax collectors. And then the third one is what we'll focus on today. The third occasion, uh, Jesus teaches explicitly about dinner party etiquette. We learned last week about the rules for the road, and so I thought it might be appropriate for us to learn another set of rules, just three simple rules of dinner party etiquette. What is it like to, what does Jesus say that his disciples should do when they're at a dinner party? And so we'll see, pick up in Luke 14. Uh, this takes place on a Sabbath day. It, um, you'll see in verse 1, one Sabbath when Jesus went to eat in, one of, in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him, uh, it goes on to describe a healing that takes place and there's that controversy around, can you heal on the Sabbath? Is that lawful? And, you know, he, he has that encounter, but we'll skip down to verse 7. It says, when he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he told them this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor for a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both, both of you will come and say to you, give this person your seat. Then, humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he will say to you, friend, move up to a better place. Then you will be honored in the presence of all the other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Jesus' first rule of dinner party etiquette is to go last in line. Now, remember that he, it says that he told them this parable. So while this is good advice and it's interesting advice and it's, it's certainly something that sounds wise to do, Jesus is speaking to a deeper spiritual truth than simply taking the, the lowest seat. And why would, we, why would someone choose the place of honor at the table for themselves? And I believe that is because we, they would find their value in being recognized by others. It's when we care more about my interest and my advancement than I do about the interests and honor of those around me. In other words, we put ourselves first. We think the only way to get ahead is if we put ourselves there. But in Jesus' school of discipleship, we learn that elevating ourselves and pursuing our own advancement is all wrong. That's what deserves a failing grade. When we think it's so important for us to claw our way to the top, to declare ourselves the king of the mountain, we're actually only setting ourselves up for a fall. And it's far better to place ourselves at the bottom as the servant of all and let God do the exalting. This doesn't mean that we're going to have to run around trying to serve everyone. You know, it doesn't mean that we insist on always going last or that we refuse positions of honor or leadership. It doesn't mean to literally always be the last person in line. Obviously, if we tried to do that in our fifth Sunday lunch, no one would start, right? <laughs> That'd be a challenge. But it means approaching life and status with an open hand. That human recognition is not where I find my identity. The, the only one whose approval and acceptance I'm concerned about is God's. So that attitude, it frees me up to think about others because I'm not preoccupied with my own advancement, my own desires. When Paul wrote to the Philippians, he put it like this, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. So this is the advice that Jesus gives to the dinner guests who have come and who clearly show um, a different value system. And so he's challenging the dinner guests. But then we see, next he turns to the host in verse 12. Then Jesus said to his host, when you give a luncheon or dinner, 
Do not, inv- do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you'll be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. So Jesus' second rule of dinner party etiquette, take the leftovers. That's not the most PC way of referring to people, I, I admit, but I think it helps get the point across that we are to associate with those who can't repay, those, the people no one else wants to invite over. Jesus is making a very important point here. He isn't saying, don't ever eat with your friends and family. You know, I think that's pretty obvious. He's, he's making a point, he's uh, using hyperbole in a sense. Of course, there's nothing wrong with having a meal with those you love and that you want to be around. But try to hear Jesus' instruction in its original context of the social maneuvering of his day. In first century Judea, meals and dinner parties could be used as a way to climb the social ladder. Make sure you get in with the right crowd. Be calculating about how and to whom you do favors. You can get ahead in life by making others indebted to you. And so Jesus is challenging this value system where we only associate with those that we think will be a benefit to us somewhere down the line. That kind of social maneuvering and manipulation and calculation is what Jesus says is a failing grade in his school of discipleship. Instead, he advocates for mimicking the radical generosity of God, of the Father. Give without worrying about being paid back not just with our money, but with our lives, with our time, with our attention. I think that this is rightly applied to the church setting as well as to our own individual lives. Um, You know, the early church was accused by its critics of being full of worthless people. Hear what uh, one church historian, Bruce Shelley, says. Throughout the first three centuries, the majority of believers were simple, humble people, slaves, women, traders, and soldiers. Perhaps this is simply because most in the population were in this class. But at any rate, Celsus, the outspoken critic of Christianity, took note of it. So this is a, uh, an early kind of Greek philosopher um, in kind of the second century. And he wrote this, <clears throat> Far from us, say the Christians, be any man uh, possessed of any culture or wisdom or judgment. Their aim is to convince only worthless and contemptible people, idiots, slaves, poor women, and children. These are the only ones whom they manage to turn into believers. Sounds pretty harsh. It actually sounds a lot like some of the new atheists of our day. Now, Celsus's claim was grossly exaggerated, as there were actually many brilliant thinkers, brilliant minds, and people of the noble class among the early Christians. But it's actually to the church's credit that they did not neglect the poor and the despised, that those were also welcomed, as well as the intellectuals. And so <clears throat> I'm forced to, to reflect in myself to do, do I, do we limit who we are willing to associate with? I know it's tempting for some Christians to draw back from church because they don't think the Christians they find at church are cool enough. They aren't the kind of social crowd that they respect or value. And it's great when you find people that you naturally click with, that you can, um, that can be a fantastic blessing. It's a source of much needed refreshment. There's nothing wrong with that. But when it comes down to it, the church is not a club designed for social advancement. We do not limit membership to those who are rich enough, to those who can provide enough influence or skills that we deem valuable. The church is for those who know they are broken. It's for those who know they need a savior. It's for the outcast and the burdened. It's what our earthly government can only dream of in their most aspirational poems. You know the poem that uh, is carved into a plaque in the Statue of Liberty? This is um, part of the poem goes like this. Give me your tired, 
You're poor. You're huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. This sentiment is very noble, but America never has and never could live up to this ideal. These words reflect the human hope that can only ever be realized in the church, in the bride of Christ, in the family of God, which has enough room to accept these huddled masses that can bring true freedom and relief. You know, Jesus concluded his advice to the guests and to the host by saying, although they, the poor, cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. That's an interesting phrase. You know, the Bible consistently teaches that there will be a day of judgment, a day that God will set all things right. He will raise the dead and hold all people to account, bringing just punishment and reward. And so Jesus wants to prepare his disciples for that day. You know, um, I think it's, it's important to clarify that we do not earn our salvation, and that's not what Jesus is teaching here. But there is clear, consistent teaching about reward for faithful service. While we are accepted and entrance into it is a free gift. And so uh, let's hear, as soon as Jesus mentions this reference to the resurrection of the righteous, uh, in verse 15 it says, when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, hey, blessed is the one who will eat bread at the feast in the kingdom of God. Well, Jesus replied to this exclamation, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so clearly I can't come, right? The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Jesus likes to speak in riddles. He likes to make you think about it and work for the point that he's getting at. You know, why would this be his response to blessed is the one who will eat bread at the feast in the kingdom of God? I think it's because the, the guest assumed all present would be there, would be sharing in that feast. And Jesus tells this story of, don't be so sure that you're going to want to go when the time comes. This parable sheds new light on what it means to be in the kingdom of God. And the last and greatest rule, the greatest rule for dinner party etiquette is don't miss the party. Don't miss the party. Jesus compares the kingdom to a lot of different things throughout the Gospel of Luke. He compares it to a mustard seed that is so small and yet it grows up and becomes this giant tree. It's like yeast that's small and it's mixed in throughout a whole batch of flour. It's like seed that's sown in the soil. It's like a narrow door. It's like a banquet feast. It's a generous party, a free gift of grace but will you accept it or will you be too busy to come? You know, a big question that many had during this day around different groups was how many people are going to be saved? Who's, who's in the in crowd and who's going to be excluded? You know, different groups defined strict boundaries around who could or would be included in the righteous, in the eternal kingdom. And it's an important question to consider. Clearly there is a line but the focus in their minds on was on who would be considered good enough. 
And I think there's a, a passage in the previous chapter that I want us to look at, which sheds light on this last parable of Jesus that we're looking at today. So if, if you'll flip back with me um, to Luke chapter 13, verse 22. And there it says, uh, Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. We read that part. And then it says, someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? Who's going to be in that kingdom feast? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. People will come from east and west and north and south and will take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and first who will be last. It's quite a startling, troubling teaching of Jesus. It's kind of a wake-up call, and it's intended to be that. But notice, he doesn't really answer the question, does he? The question they asked him was, are only a few people going to be saved? And he says, uh, that's not the right question, actually. I'm going to answer the question that you should have asked, which is, when is the time for salvation? And the time is now. Don't delay. Don't worry about how many will be saved. Leave that to God. But the time is now. Today is the day of salvation. Tomorrow may be too late. Get in while you can, is what Jesus says. Or as it says in Hebrews, for as long as it is called today, do not harden your heart to God's call. You have the opportunity. That opportunity is always before you as long as it is called today. Let God worry about how many will be saved. All I know is that you have the opportunity before you. And it would be foolish to pass it up because you wanted the head count before you agreed to join. One biblical commentator puts it like this. To a question concerning the number of the saved, Jesus gives an answer concerning the time of salvation. At present, the door is still open. But when once locking up time has arrived, the chance to get in will be passed. On whatever grounds the latecomers may base their appeal to be recognized by the Lord and admitted to his kingdom, they say they have met him, they say they've listened to him. The fact remains that they did not actually take the opportunity to go in through his narrow door when it was open before them. Jesus' words about the narrow door of urgency, it doesn't entail panic preaching or stampede decisions, but they do focus on the all-important now and the necessity of an honest use of the present moment. Elsewhere, we see in scripture that that narrow door is Jesus himself. He says, I am the gate. I'm the door. I'm the, the one true way. And so it's faith trusting in him and his completed work for us that allows us entrance through that door. God's invitation doesn't require payment. It doesn't require enough rule keeping. In that sense, it's free. And yet at the same time, Jesus teaches it requires all of you. It requires full surrender. It requires giving up and letting go of all the man-made ways that we try to save ourselves. You know, this is easier to accept for the person who knows they're desperate, who knows that they have nothing else to lose. It's a lot harder for the person who's still clinging on to some source of security. Maybe they're comfortable in life. Maybe they've been working the worldly system and they've been succeeding. They've gained power, influence, wealth. Now, I'm not saying that those things are inherently wrong, but the question is, is that where they find their security, their safety, their source of salvation? You know, it's exactly what Jesus talks about in that parable at the end, uh, you know, in chapter 14, 
the excuses that were given by those who refused to come. You know, I've got a plot of land that I just purchased, and I've got to go check it out. Well, you'd think that they would have prepared it in advance and gone to investigate that land before they bought it, right? That's kind of a strange thing for them to be doing. So clearly, it, it, and even if they did neglect going to inspect it beforehand, does it have to be now? It's, it's a really uh, a shallow excuse. And the same with the yoke of oxen. Hey, you should have inspected that ahead of time. There should have been preparation done in advance. But no, now is the time that I need to go do some more work. I'm too busy with the things that I'm doing in my life to come enjoy what the Lord has prepared. Or even a relationship like marriage. Now, it's interesting because in the, the Old Testament law, it, you know, people have noted that there was uh, an exemption from military service. If you were newly married, you didn't have to serve for a year so that you could spend time with your wife. But that doesn't mean you guys are supposed to be recluses and you know, never go out to a social function. And so treating a banquet as if it's military service is an insult to, to the master, to the one who's inviting. So we see here these concerns with, with worldly possessions, with worldly relationships, and neglecting the invitation. Again, I want to read from a, a biblical commentator who puts it like this. You know, one had a field, another some oxen, a third his new bride, but all alike place the invitation to the banquet lower down their scale of values. And to prefer anything, whatever, to God's invitation is to debar oneself from entry through the narrow door. All the preferences must go. So a man may approach the doorway to the kingdom, bringing his own religious ideas, his own status and reputation, his own calculated advantage, or his own scale of values. But he will have to shed every one of these things if he is to pass through that door. There is no room for them. Naked he came into the world, naked he will go out of it. And in the same way, it is naked that he must pass from his unconverted life into the life of the kingdom of God. You know, these are some of the things that we are faced with in this parable of the banquet. So how can we be challenged by this teaching and be imitators of what Jesus is speaking about? And first, I want to point out the fact that we actually imitate his teaching, this banquet of a collection of all who are invited in, those who are gathering from the north, the south, the east, the west. We imitate it every time we take communion together, as we just did today. It may not be a big meal. You know, we have our little wafer. It's, it's not quite what they did in the early church where they'd gather around a, a full meal, the love feast. But we are eating and drinking together as a symbol of the union that we have together in Christ and what we will one day enjoy together at the banquet in the kingdom of God. You know, um, it says in Isaiah chapter 25, uh, it paints this beautiful picture that gets picked up in Revelation, but they're drawing off of this first image in Isaiah 25 verse 6, where it says, On this mountain, Yahweh Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Yahweh will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. Yahweh has spoken. So I just want us to reflect on that fact that the, the significance that we have in breaking bread together, even if it's once a month and even if it is just a small token of that reality. But I want us to also reflect on a few other ways to put this into practice. And so the first thing to consider is serving somebody, to pursue humility and service. You know, when Jesus talks about taking that lowest position, the lowest seat of honor, uh, you know, we, we don't have seats of honor in, in our dinner tables and when we gather together. Um, but what, the way that we do apply this is in our service, in the ways that we put others' interests above our own. And so finding some way that we can 
put someone, others, another person's interest above our own to serve them in some way is a simple way that we can put this into practice. But secondly, invite somebody over. Mimic the generosity of God. Have people over for a meal. You know, I don't know how it would go if you were to say, hey, I'm going to throw a lunch in. I'm going to invite all the poor, the, the crippled, the lame, the blind. Um, I, I don't know how you'd go about finding those people exactly. And I, I don't think there's an exact one-for-one -one correlation in how we apply that. But in principle, we can apply it. In opening up our, our homes or our lives or going out to dinner or different ways that we can associate with others especially in this church family, but also outside of this church family. You know, when you realize that the generosity that you've been shown, you want to express that generosity to those around you. You're inspired to do likewise. When you realize how much you've been forgiven, it makes it easier to be a forgiving person. And so inviting somebody over is a start. It's a tangible way of, of putting this into practice, but really living this out goes deeper than that too. It's about expressing God's generosity in all areas of life, a generosity with your time and attention and your care and your resources. It's a generosity that does not calculate how you can get it all back. And thirdly, another way is to repent of distractions. To reflect on and repent of the other things that you're pursuing that might prevent you from accepting God's invitation to his party. The invitation that he has of what he's doing to join him in the, the work that he's doing. You know, if you have a, a hard time prioritizing worship with other believers, how certain are you that you wouldn't prioritize other things in life if God called you to his end time banquet? Uh, now, I'm not saying it's a cardinal sin to miss church. Don't mishear me. It's you know, it happens. Um, but really think about the priorities in your life. Is your life filled with keeping busy? Or is it filled with intentional living in service of God? Learning at Jesus' feet, caring for others, and bearing one another's burdens, worshiping with God's people. If God sent his messengers to say, hey, the worship service is ready. The food's hot. Come have a meal in my house. Would you say, oh, thanks, but I'm really busy. You know, I've got, a, I've got a trip to go on. I've got work to do. I've got to clean my house. You know, it's really important for me to, to, to prepare that first day of the week for the rest of the week. You know, my kid has a baseball game. Or, hey, I'd rather just spend some time at home with my wife. Please consider me excused. Now, don't mishear me. I'm not up here criticizing anyone for missing a Sunday morning. Uh, I understand that schedule conflicts come up. Uh, our lead pastor is, is gone today. Maybe it's my you know, subtle criticism of him. I'm totally kidding. It's not. It's okay. I'm just proving the point that it's okay to miss, it's, it's okay to miss a church service. But what if we looked at this life as training ground for eternity? What if something comes up that that keeps us from attending a Sunday morning service. Are you then seeking a way to designate time to worship and to learning from the word with your family? There's other ways, and it, it's okay when there's occasions that come up. How often, though, do we allow those schedule conflicts to come up? And is it a matter of our prioritization? Does something need to change? Do we need to repent of the distractions that are going on in our lives. And so we take to heart Jesus' teaching, his dinner party etiquette for the kingdom, and find ways that we can apply it in our own lives to be the church that includes all peoples. And what a privilege it is that we get to gather together um, with people from all different walks of life and that, that there is no seat of honor. That wasn't always true in the church. You know, I'm reflected as I am going through studying church history, there was a time when you had to pay for the pew in a lot of churches, and you had to pay for your spot, and there were seats of honor that really um, was dishonoring to the Lord. And so we just reflect on 
just the relationships that we can now form in, in this community, how we can put others' interests above our own. Let's pray. <coughs> Father, we thank you first and foremost for your generosity towards us. Lord, for the free gift of entrance into your kingdom because of the sacrifice of your son on the cross, because he so generously gave of his life so that we could join your family. Lord, help us to live that out in our relationships, in our lives, in our priorities. Lord, help us to be transformed by that truth and to be empowered by your spirit to go out and call those in the highways and hedges, those who are in the outskirts, Lord, those in our community who need that invitation to the banquet. Pray that you would just empower us by your spirit for that task. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I invite you to stand with me as I read our benediction from Revelation chapter 19, where it says, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Amen.